Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Jesus gave us a command saying, take no thought. What does that mean? It simply means stop worrying about anything. Worry will cut your life off short. Worry takes the most skeptical attitude about the things of life, and we should shape our attitude around the promises of God. God promises you deliverance out of every situation if you'll trust in Him. Let's do that together and go to the Word of God. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome again to Student of the Word. For those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome. Glad to have you. For those who've been watching for some time, thanks for coming back. And for those who've been watching for a long time, and really are part of my prayer group as far as partners are concerned and those that support me on a monthly basis, thank you also. And uh, perhaps you've been watching long enough to where you begin to think, you know, I want to support this broadcast. Please do so. We can use it. We don't use it for just ourselves around here. This is for expansion, reaching more people. And all the time, we keep getting more and more testimonies about the blessing of God. Why don't you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to take a look at verse 32. And while you're finding that, again, if you'd like to become a partner with me, go to bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me and join me along with a group of great people that support this broadcast. You'll become one of just a partner group, uh, friends of the ministry. And as God even said of Abraham, now you're a friend. And so beyond being just an acquaintance, just being a child of God, God wants you to be a friend. And being more than just an acquaintance with his broadcast, you become a friend. Thank you for it. Uh, Jesus often used the term when he was speaking to the disciples and says, take no thought. Now, we wonder what that means. Better translation is just stop worrying because it's the mind up here that causes your problem. It's not your spirit. No, your worry becomes up here because you start to analyze things and predict how things are going to turn out. It doesn't look too good. And you always go back to, you know, well, I've seen this happen before. So you go back and quote statistics. This has happened before. This is usually what happens. Put your trust in God because God guarantees you that if you'll follow after him, everything will be a success. And so when Jesus said again, take no thought, it's actually a command command. Don't worry. A command. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 32 that I had you find says it this way, and Paul wrote this way, I want you to be without care. This means worry or anxieties. And I want you to notice Paul really presented it more as a wish or a desire, but Jesus presented it as a command. Paul says here, I want you to be without care. But again, he was dealing with the Corinthians. So the Corinthians here were, you know, big problems. And Paul says basically here, this is a wish. I really wish you guys were mature. I wish you guys would grow up. But it didn't stop them from being Christians, but they were carnal Christians. One indicator of a carnal Christian is they worry about everything, have anxieties about everything. But I want to come back to what Jesus said, take no thought. Again, this was a command. A command was simply, don't worry, stop it. This is as much a command as thou shalt not kill. We often quote the 10 commandments. These are commandments. Well, it's a commandment from Jesus, not to worry. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know what we're simply saying here? If you worry, you're putting something ahead of God. You are putting your own opinion, your own thought, your own judgment on a situation above the judgments and thoughts of God. When you read the word of God, you're gonna find out that, yeah, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Afflictions are just promised in the word of God, but deliverance out of them all is also promised in the word of God. God promised you that as long as you're in this broken world, this cast down world that is in this condition because of the sin of Adam in the garden, he said, you're gonna have problems. You'll have problems with Satan himself, the world system, and your own flesh is gonna come at you. But don't understand this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. So if not worrying is as much a command as thou shalt not kill, then we need to see the severity of what God says that worry will do to you. This was not a wish or desire, but a command from God just as dangerous, if not more than adultery or murder, as, or as I said, putting another God in front of God. I like to think of it this way. Worry is a slow form of suicide. It'll kill you. God has an intention for you to live long on this earth, but literally your attitude will cut your life short. Your attitude really affects most everything in life. It affects your health. 
It affects your relationships with others. And worry, again, is a slow form of suicide. It'll kill you. And uh, Jesus said, worry is a danger to our spiritual as well as our natural life. If you worry, you cannot reach maturity. One of the greatest indicators that you have become mature in the things of God is you cast your burdens on the Lord. You decide, I'm not gonna worry about this at all. Let me just say this, worry is always future. God's taking care. Worry does not stop and calculate what God has done for me up to now. No wonder the Bible says, don't forget all his benefits. I think one of the greatest things you can do as a Christian is to journal the miracles that happen in your life, to journal the great things that happen to you, how God has brought you out. And you'll begin to find out, you think this is big? Stop and think about it. I've come through bigger things than this. On top of that, if God could save you, take you out of Satan's kingdom, take you out of Satan's family, put you into his own kingdom, put you in his own family where Satan had no future for you except hell. Now you have a future on this earth of great blessing, of great prosperity, of great things for God. Plus you have heaven to look forward to. My Lord, you can, listen, if God could do all that, if he could make you a child of God and take you out of Satan's kingdom, if he could give you eternal life and take away death from you, if he could introduce you to a life of eternity in heaven, a resurrection body one day, the millennial kingdom of God on this earth. If he has all that promise for you, then who are you to worry about the future? If God has done all that before and promised you a great future, why should you worry? In other words, worry again is always future and worry is worse for you than oftentimes a sickness or a disease because it will cut your life off. And in the meantime, you might have a sickness in your body, but you still have trust in God. And your, your attitude can be, Lord, I'm going to come through this. You're going to heal me of this. And on the other hand, if I don't see a momentary healing, I'm going to come through this on the other side anyway. Because you've told me I'm walking in divine health. Divine health doesn't mean I won't have an attack now and then. But if I'm living in health, then I'm going to come out of this thing. That's because your promises are true. Your promises are just. And they will always come to pass. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14 says this. The ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares. The word care is another word for worry. That's why Jesus says, take no care. Take no thought. Don't don't take the cares of this world on you. He says they go out and are choked with cares, the riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. So here's what the Lord is simply saying. Notice this is mentioned right there with pleasures of life being used wrong, no fruit in maturity, the riches of this life used wrong because why? You are choked with cares and worries. To look at a situation and always think, well, this could happen this way. And you begin to think about that, meditate on it. Understand this, most of the things you worry about, I would say this, probably 80% of what you worry about never comes to pass. Did you ever think about that? Think of all the times you thought this could happen, this could happen, and it didn't happen. Even without God, most people in life who are sinners, they worry about everything in the future, and and 90%, 80% of what they worry about doesn't come to pass. And even the 10% that does come to pass, it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be. And even man without God with a brain in his head can work out some of the problems. If I can work out some of my problems, think about how God can work my problems out. I'm just a human being throwing natural answers at it. God is a supernatural being throwing supernatural answers toward me. Again, worry is always future. God's gonna take the same care of you tomorrow as he's done every day up until now. Why would he fail you today? To look back on your past and say, God, you've done so much for me, but are you gonna do it today? God's gonna go, yes, I promised you I would, because you know what? You're, I care for you. You're part of my family. Next of all, you're, you're literally, you are a child of God. You're part of my family. And next of all, I've got a great future for you. I've told about you in the word of God. Why do you think it's so important that we take his yoke upon us and learn of him? The most important thing you can do as a Christian is learn the word of God, then begin to act on it. Make it the primary thing for your life. Instead of looking at the problems, look at the answers because the word of God is the answer. Focus on on your answers and you can endure your problems. So the best thing you can do is focus on now, live in this moment. Yesterday is gone and it cannot be changed. You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but you do know this, God's gonna take care of me and whatever happens tomorrow, it's gonna be for my good and it'll be for my betterment. Live in the moment. Jesus talked about that. Give no thought for tomorrow. Give no thought again is worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. 
you know, I invest in the stock market and, you know, I've got some, some returns have come back through the years for a retirement account. But you know what? There's a great tendency to look at it, see it going down today and begin to think, oh, 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 it's headed on down. There's momentary downturns, then you go right back up again. The point of it is, is I go to see the man that, you know, uh, quarterly I go see and they tell him about my investments. He begins to tell me what's always happened in the past and what that, and what predictors they have for the future and quote all these things. And I think, well, this guy knows more than I do. Think about this. Study the the word of God, God knows more than you do. Instead of looking at this momentary downturn in your life and think, oh, it's going to hell in a handbasket. No, you're not. God promised you're going to heaven in a resurrection body. So if that's my future, then apparently God's going to take care of this momentary glitch in life, this momentary problem of life. Understand it again, worry is useless. Will worry change anything? Worry can steal your present joy. Worry can cause destruction in your life. Worry can break families apart. God would not command us to be free from worry if it wasn't possible. God has a life for us that has no worry at all. In fact, the series I'm offering is going to talk about rest with God. Rest is the absence of worry. I'm not talking about resting, laying down in a bed. I'm talking about internal rest for the soul, rest for your thoughts, spiritual rest that comes from a spirit filled with God's word, a soul that is filled with God's word that you act on. Those things stored in your memory that God says, begin to pull those files out like you do your computer. And when a problem comes along, instead of the first thing looking at the problem, quit focusing on the problem and go to the promises where I give you the answer for those problems. It seems like with Israel, the moment they came through some victorious thing, they shouted, rejoiced, and the next thing they looked at, they fell apart. In fact, we're told in the book of Hebrews chapter three and four, they always turned away from God. They always fretted, they always worried, and they always turned against the promises of God for 40 years. It took the second generation coming out to go into the promised land to where the people begin to realize in that second generation, our parents never did trust in God. We're gonna try and we're gonna start trusting in God and look at the great success they had. It simply comes back to this, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the momentary thing that's happened to you or are you focusing on the eternal word of God, the God that has taken care of you every moment of every day up until now will not fail? One thing the first generation said is we figured out God's plan when they came to Meribah. We figured out God's plan. He brought us here to kill us. <laughs> Think about that. 400 years, God protected them. 400 years, he preserved their life. They came to the time to leave Egypt. He bankrupted Egypt, sent 10 plagues on them, drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea, brought out the Israelites into the wilderness. They said, we finally figured this out. God did all this to bring us here and kill us. No, God has already promised them they're going in the promised land. He already told them Canaan belongs to them. He promised they would eat of milk and honey and eat the, the grapes and all that. They forgot all about that. And all they said was, we figured out that God wants to kill us. That's what worry does to you. Looks at the present situation, looks at the fact we're living in a desert. There is no food, there is no provision. And we're looking at all these things around us. So the only thing that's gonna happen to us is we're all gonna die right here on the spot. Oh yeah, that's the real plan of God. Well, you know what? You might laugh at that, but that's what worry does to you. Worry says, I'm gonna die right here on the spot. Not gonna make it out of this situation. And God says, look back on you. I saved you before the foundation of the world or saw you saved before the foundation of the world. I've met every problem with and condition up until now and been faithful. Why should I let you down now? I'll see you right after the break. Even though we know that all storms of life are only temporary, they sometimes seem like they are about to engulf us, sink us and take us under. At this moment, the wind and waves may be raging, heaving, and crashing all around you, but there is a refuge and rest in the Lord. But even if you are in the center of a storm, far from all other help, you can cast all your cares on the Lord and enter into God's supernatural rest, right there in the very middle of that storm. Join Pastor Bob Yandian as he explains what you must know and believe in order to sail through all the storms of life completely at peace and totally burden-free. To order Resting Through the Storms of Life, go to bobyandian.com. Every believer will face trials. It's just a fact of this life. But every believer also has the promise from Jesus to help them through each one. In this encouraging six-part series by Pastor Bob Yandian, you will learn how to walk boldly 
and courageously through the trials of this life by applying the Word of God. Messages include Joy and Patience, How to Get Answers to Prayer, Riches and Trials, Outlasting the Trials, and Our Worst Enemy. To order Outlasting Trials, go to bobbyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. God wouldn't command us to be free from worry if it wasn't possible. God has a life for you and God has a life for me, which has no worry included in it at all. You know, you think about how do I do that though? David gave it to us in the very opening Psalm. I mean, the very first verses of Psalm 1 tell us that he promised us that if we would meditate on his word day and night, that we'd be like a tree planted beside the rivers of water. He was talking about a life in a desert. You know what? This whole earth is a desert basically because it's under a curse, but there's a river running through it. Those that are born again are planted right beside the river. And we don't be concerned by what's happening over there because there is no river there. I'm planted beside the rivers of water. Loretta and I went for a number of years ago, we went on a trip uh, before the kids were born and we drove out to California in our little Toyota. That's all we had. And we were, you know, didn't have a whole lot of money. So, but we drove out there to see some relatives and stay with them. And so on the way we were going, and I mean, we were going through the western part of the country and we went through uh, New Mexico and Arizona and places like that. And But the closer we got uh, to California, we came to the Colorado River and the Colorado River was running wrong and we looked over there and it was just desert everywhere. But right beside that river, it was green. It was green on both sides of it going down. Why? Because the, the vegetation beside it wasn't concerned about rainfall. It didn't need rainfall. It had a stream of water there. That's what a Christian is like. You are planted beside the rivers of living water and that living water flour flourishes you and makes you can grow in the midst of a world around you. Why look out there where there is no water? Realize I'm planted right here beside the water. It said, but the unbeliever is not so. This is more than just the unbeliever. This is also a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian isn't grounded in the things of God. Our grounding is in the word of God. That's where our nourishment comes from. That's where we as a plant draw our water from. And the word of God is that stream of water we are planted beside. So we don't worry about the things of life around us. We have a perpetual input into our life for growth. And so this is what happens. It says, but the unbelievers not so, or the carnal Christian, they're like a tumbleweed and they're blown about by the winds everywhere they go because they have no root. It's one of the things brought out where the Lord spoke about the four types of ground. This one has no root in itself and so becomes upset, bitter. Why? Because it starts to worry about everything. The word for worry in the Greek means to be drawn in two directions. This was the problem in the Philippian congregation. They were drawn in two directions and divided between two strong women leaders in the church. And Paul brought this out in Philippians 4 too. It means to have a divided attention. Worry says, I know God says this, but look over at my problem. Look over here and then, no, 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 no. I think the word says, but look at my problem. And you bounce back and forth and back and forth. You're drawn in two directions and divided and you can't get anywhere. James chapter one. Verses five through eight says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it'll be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven, tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. What is this double-mindedness he's talking about? It's looking at things in worry, and in faith. And it's not saying that you never consider faith, it's that you consider faith as an alternative to worry and worry as an alternative to faith. You bounce back and forth, back and forth, and you can't grow. One of the things that James told his congregation was this, he said, a person that's divided in their attention between worry and faith is like having a water fountain that you turn on and sometimes it, it sends up good water and other times it sends up salt water. 
What would you think if you came to a water fountain and turned on for the moment, it's putting out salt water, you look at it and go, what's that? You taste it, got salt in it, but all of a sudden then fresh water comes out. You start to take a drink and all of a sudden that's gone and salt water's back again. That's what the Lord says with you. I can't find anything I can use in you because when you look at faith, it's momentary, but then you meditate on worry, then you're back to faith. And he says, you're tossed about back and forth like a wave of the sea, tossed about by the wind. And the winds are the doctrines of men, the opinions of men, and the things coming out of your mind because because your mind is not stabilized, you are a double-minded man. The Greek word there means a double-souled man. It's like you got two souls on the inside of you, one listening to your spirit, one listening to your flesh, and back and forth, back and forth, it says you're unstable in all of your ways. Anyone who worries is unstable in everything that he does because it doesn't just affect one part of your life. You start looking at everything in your life through the eyes of worry, and God says, stop it. Worry is the sin of self-occupied believers, self-centeredness. Paul said, I don't worry about anything, but in every situation by prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know what that means not to worry about anything? It means not to worry about anything. It means to look at the things of life and say, you know what? God's already made a promise. I'm not even concerned of that. As far as I'm concerned, God's gonna bring me through this thing. In the meantime, I'm gonna keep on witnessing to people, live my life before the Lord, keep my prayer life up, keep the promises of God up. I'm gonna keep on living as I always did. And I'm gonna let God bring me through this. He will give me wisdom when I need it. And that's why he said in every situation by prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He didn't say don't pray about it, but pray about it in faith by prayer accompanied with thanksgiving. Prayer, praise God's word, and then thanksgiving, thank God that his word is gonna to come to pass. Look at your future through thanksgiving and praise, not through worry. Let your request be made known to God. Jesus told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You know what that means? Stop worrying. Fear is a motivator to worry. In other words, worry takes a look at things through the eyes of fear, not the eyes of faith. And Jesus said in the last days, men's heart would fail them for fear. So your heart fails you and you start to worry about everything. Why? Because you start looking at things in fear. God doesn't want you to fear. Listen, there's plenty of things in life to fear about, but treat each one of them and look at each one of them in faith with the word of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, verse 25 through 34, listen to what he said. He said, not to worry. In fact, he said, consider the birds of the air and consider the lilies of the field. He said, the lilies of the field, he said, they don't spin, they don't toil. He said, they don't even sew their clothes, but God dresses them in fabulous dress. And he says, even Solomon with the greatest, uh, you know, uh, seamstresses around him and making the finest of clothes couldn't look as good as a flower does. A flower looks better than him because God clothes the flower. Then he said, look up at the sky, see the birds flying over. Of course they were outside. This was the Sermon on the Mount. They're sitting on the side of a hill here and he just simply uses nature around him as a means of teaching. He says, look down on the ground, now look up in the air. So they looked at the ground and the literally the lilies were as far as you can see. And God said, I take care of every single one of them. You might look at yourself and say, but Lord, there's 8 billion people on the earth. How can you even stop and remember me? David did that. What is man that you're even mindful of him? Or the offspring of man that you would even come and visit him? He was simply trying to bring God down to his level instead of bringing himself up to God's level and looking at himself through the eyes of God. Do you ever look at yourself through the eyes of God? It's important you do so. Worry will cause you to grow in the slightest things in the wrong direction. The smallest of things become major for a worrier. I mean, you worry about some ingredient in your food. You worry about what time it is and what happens usually during the days on the, during the day, during those times, any other time. You look at situations in the office that always seem to turn out this way. Why don't you start looking at it God's way because God flows in the other direction. In other words, a person that follows God is swimming upstream. But after a while, going upstream becomes a normal way of life. Walking on water is just a normal way of life where you don't even think about it anymore. That's what happens when you quit worrying and trusting in God. The supernatural way of life becomes a normal way of life. and You begin to realize something. Everybody else is going in the wrong direction. I'm going in the right direction. I love what he said about the, about the flowers. They don't toil, they don't spin, but yet I always take care of them. Look at the birds of the air. He said, they're flying overhead. Do they ever worry about food? He said, no, I've always been able to feed the birds of the air. And what he said was this at the closing of that, of that uh, teaching on the Sermon on Mount, that particular section. He said, God didn't die for them. He died for you. 
You're the one he loves. You're the child of God. Won't, he, won't God take more care of you, the one that he died for and, and shed his blood for, and the one that's redeemed you? In other words, what he's saying is worry places you below the level of a flower. And God didn't even die for flowers. He didn't send Jesus to die for flowers. But here's something God didn't have his son die for, but yet he takes care of him. If God will take care of a flower, won't he take care of you? For you to worry puts yourself below the level of a flower. Here's something else. Worry puts you below the level of a bird. Do you know this? The birds never even knew we had a Great Depression. They flew over it. They always had food, no matter what. They'd fly over and go, I'm sure if they could talk to each other, like, what are those long lines down there? I don't know. Why are those people standing in long lines? Well, we were standing in long lines because we worried about food, that God couldn't take care of us. And so people there, even many that knew the Lord, were standing there worried about what was going to happen tomorrow. And God's birds were flying overhead. What an example. What a testimony. What a witness to us to simply look up and think, well, guess what? Birds are still flying over. I guess God still takes care of them. He'll take care of me because Jesus shed his blood for me. Those birds won't be in heaven, but I will. Those birds don't have a future. I have a future. God still takes care of them. He'll take even better care of me. So worry puts you below the level of a bird. They didn't know the Great Depression came. They went right through the whole thing and God took care of them through the whole thing. How important to understand is, you know, I quit listening to the news so much and read the news. Once in a while, I'll tune in a little bit. But the point of it is, I look at all the things I just missed. <laughs> They'll talk about this and just happen to think, I didn't know that. God just did take care of me every day, always takes care of me. Why should I worry when I have a God that takes care of me and is concerned about me? Worry separates us from the delivering power of God. I'm gonna quote those verses again that I just quoted. Psalm 1, verses one through three. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Who are you getting your counsel from? Godly people or ungodly people? The books of the world or the books that Jesus has placed in the Bible? He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. You open the way for sinners instead of blocking them. And you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. This has all got to do with mental attitude. You're either in the path of sinners blocking them or you're sitting in the seat of the scornful because you look at every situation through the eyes of worry and you constantly think it won't turn out, it won't turn out, it won't turn out. You might be one of those that if you're asked your opinion, you always give a lousy opinion. You always tell why it won't work. God's simply saying, don't be scornful. But your delight is in the law of the Lord. This is exactly what God is saying. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. When you wake up in the nighttime, what should you be thinking about? Listen, sometimes the nighttime is when you wake up and thoughts of worry come to you. What's going to happen? What's going to take those things by captivity, captivate those things, pull them into the obedience of the things of the law of the word of God and begin to meditate on the word of God, not only in the day, but also during the nighttime. It said, he'll be like a tree planted beside the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. In other words, those things are planted by the rivers of water, again, in the midst of a desert, don't, aren't concerned about anything. All the other things out there have something to worry about. I don't have anything to worry about. Right beside me is a river that will never, ever run dry. When we're free from worry, we're like a tree planted beside a river of water that will never be subject to the droughts of life. Our leaf will be green and will continue to produce fruit, but the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Chaff, tumbleweeds have no roots and they're carried by by every wind of doctrine, every thought that comes along by the world's thoughts or by some Christian's thoughts that aren't even listening to the word of God. And God wants you to listen to him because why he cares for you. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.